Wisdom will keep, defend, and protect us. We will walk in the paths of righteousness. When we walk, our steps will not be hampered. Our path will be clear and open. And when we run, we shall not stumble. We consider well the part of our feet, and we let all our ways be established and ordered by you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we look carefully to how we walk. We live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as unwise or witless, but as a wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of our time and buying up every opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, people of the Virgin Islands. Wherever you are in the diaspora, we hope that you're tuned in. We want to welcome you to this consultative and informative session. This is our live stream signature event that is designed to include those of you who might not be able to attend our town meetings. To date, we've had 24 educational and consultative engagements with a wide cross-section of our community. We have received about 17 comments and we have been promised to receive even more. We will provide more information soon on a few more town hall meetings for January of 2023. We do remind you at this time to visit our website www.yourconstitution.vg And while you are there, we want you to learn more about the Commission, view our schedule of meetings, make an appointment to meet with us, or have us come to your space. Leave your suggestions, opinions, desires regarding the Constitution. Remember the decisions that we make today will affect generations yet unborn. I want you now to meet the Commission. First, I want to introduce our chairman who will come back later. Ms. Lisa Penn Letson, or Mrs. Lisa Penn Letson, is the chairman of the Constitutional Review Commission. She recently completed a three-year term as the Executive Director of International Business, Mrs. Lisa Penn Letson. I also want you to meet Mayor M. Barry. Mayor M. Barry is a Virgin Islander who currently serves as Principal Crown Counsel in the Civil Division of the Attorney General Chambers. Miss Mayor Barry. We'll also like you to meet Tanya Cassie Parker. Tanya Cassie Parker is a lawyer and managing partner of the BVI Office of Global Law Firm Harneys. Then I'd like you also to meet Suzanne V. Debers. She is a native of New York City and is a graduate of New York University's Washington Square College of Arts and Science. And she received a BA in 1974. Then I want you to also meet among us here tonight, Mr. Levins. Mr. Levins was born in the British Virgin Islands uh, to Diane and Aubrey Levins. He grew up on the beautiful island of Anagata Mr. Levins obtained a private pilot license in 1999 and a few years later became a commercial pilot, Mr. Levins. Then I'd like you to meet Miss Bernadine Louie, Nee Walters. She's a British Virgin Islander who has years of experience at the management level while employed in the civil service. She's now serving as Director of Virgin Islands Studies and a job lecturer or lecturer at the college right here. 
then I'd like you to meet Dr. Benedicta P.T. Samuels. Uh, she was admitted to practice at the bar in the Virgin Islands, as well as the bars in Anguilla, Antigua, St. Kitts Nevis, following the completion of an LLB degree with honors. Then I'd like you to meet also Mr. Ronnie W. Skelton. He's a former legislator, and he's also a chartered electrical engineer with over 45 years background of very active participation in the public and private sectors. In all of these capacities, he has been working in higher managerial positions, dealing with industry-wide and national growth reforms. Then I'd like you to meet also Mr. Roger A. Smith. He was born in 1982 in Tortola, British Virgin Islands. He grew up in Joseph Dyke and Seagulls Bay. He has certificates in infrastructural development, project management, and construction. He's the owner manager of No Limit Construction Services since 2001. And finally, but not last at all and least, Dr. Charles H. Wheatley. The foundation for his lengthy educational career began at Eastern Methodist School and continued at the Leeward Islands Teachers College. Uh, Dr. Wheatley has been an educator for many decades. He continues to render community service in the church and various civic organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet the Constitutional Review Commission. I am Melvin A. Turnbull, Senior Pastor, Counselor, Chaplain, and the list goes on. I'm glad to be with you on tonight. Now, I want to turn things over to our Chairman, Mrs. Lisa Penn-Letzer. to welcome you, whether you're here in person or on social media. Tonight is the night that we have actually put aside as your night, so without further ado, I will get right into it. We would like this session to be an educational one as well as a consultative one. I would, however, crave the indulgence if I can spend about 20 minutes or so giving you an overview. And apologies in advance if it seems to sound to be a boring tour. We are conscious that we have a wide range of viewers, but you can always review this presentation on your own time. If I may, if we could go to the first slide. You should be seeing it on your screens. I'd like to give you a brief background to how we got here. Now, this is called a constitutional review exercise. We've put a series of digital clips, and in one of those clips, we explained that the Virgin Islands has had constitutional review since 1735. Our constitution was then considered as a collection of laws governing the legislature and various other conventions and practices. So we had a uncodified constitution. Over centuries, our constitution was very much determined by our relationship at the time with the Leeward Islands. However, in the mid-1900s, we decided not to join the West Indies Federation. And so the United Kingdom, henceforth, had a more direct relationship with us. Since the middle of that century, we have had three constitutions that were writ written and codified, 1967, 1976, and 2007. Our website, again, www.yourconstitution.vg, it's going to be at the bottom of all your slides. 
All this information and more is available on our website. We have posted there present and previous constitutions, cases decided under the present constitutions, the present constitution, and numerous short and easy to read articles. Just so that we can be clear on what happens after this before I turn to any other slide, I would like to go through the process just very briefly. So we're presently engaging in public education and public consultation. This would probably go on to January, at which point we will then concentrate on writing our report. The report should reflect your recommendations. At some point towards the end of next year, we would present that report to the Premier and the Governor, and it should be considered by Cabinet and then laid on the table of the House of Assembly. Also at that time, that would signal the time when the Premier would set about um, comprising a negotiating team. So these persons here will actually not be your negotiating team. We are not the people who will negotiate the Constitution with the United Kingdom. Some of us may be appointed for posterity, but generally speaking, a completely um, new negotiating team will be put together. If we turn to the next slide, we've just put this here for on the next slide, for more visual effect. And turn to the next slide, thank you. Now, I just wanted to say here that this is really a snapshot of what is included in the Constitution. So you see that, for example, there's a chapter two on the Bill of Rights. And chapters three, four, and five deals with the branches of government, the executive and legislative branches of government. Chapter six deals with the judiciary, and the judiciary is the arm that enforces the Constitution. Chapter seven deals with the public service, chapter eight with finance, and chapter nine deals with the complaints commissioner. Now the complaints commissioner also has um, governed in that office a separate piece of statutory legislation, but the Complaints Commissioner is one of the independent institutions enshrined in the Constitution. So if we go to the next slide, we see their um, constitutions. What are they? A constitution is really a collection of principles, rules, and conventions that together represent the fundamental law that governs a country. As I mentioned earlier, it need not be written or codified. The United Kingdom, for example, their constitution is unwritten. Why do we need a constitution? We need a constitution because it prescribes the limits on the powers that your government or the state can actually exercise. Now, this is a very important point because it means that for something to actually be unconstitutional, you will have to pin that back and somehow map that breach back to a, being a breach of, of the state itself and not of a private person. So the Virgin Islands has had constitutions and constitutional reforms, as I said, from the 1700s. So what's different about this one? When the 2007 Constitution was made, it was then agreed that it would be reviewed in 10 years. This is pretty peculiar because a Constitution would typically not be regularly amended. I suppose we are able to have that ability to review the Constitution like this because it's really a fundamental document as opposed to a supreme document. So our constitution is actually an ordering council of the United Kingdom, meaning it's a secondary piece of legislation in the United Kingdom. So it's not a, a primary piece of legislation that's debated and passed in the House of Commons. It's made by the Privy Council, the very same Privy Council that someone would appeal to from our Court of Appeal. 
However, the 10 year anniversary was to say the least not very convenient because it fell in 2017 when the territory witnessed catastrophic damage due to three consecutive disasters. And then after that was the pandemic. Eventually the Constitutional Review Commission was approved and appointed by cabinet in 2020. Incidentally, prior to the Commission of Inquiry. But the Commission never met. The Commission of Inquiry then ensued and recommended that the uh, Constitutional Review Commission be, that it be reconstituted, or at least that its composition be revised, and also suggested some additional terms of reference. So those recommendations were taken on board, and the persons you are seeing here tonight, including Ms. Noni Georges, who is on the screen, um, who's attending virtually. Noni is a lawyer from the high, many years as um, working with the judges and the high court registry. And um, so those of us you see here, including Noni and two others for whom I apologize, um, Mr. Shinri on Josh Van Dyke and Dr. Leonard in Virgin Gorda, we are the present Constitutional Review Commission appointed at the end of June, 2022. So some significant changes came about from the 1976 Constitution to the 2007 Constitution that are worth pointing out. One I mentioned earlier is the Complaints Commissioner. That is an office that's entrenched in the Constitution. That 2007 Constitution that we have at present also includes a Bill of Rights as well as a Human Rights Commission. However, the Human Rights Commission has never been set up. It also entrenched the register of interest and it's the director of public prosecutions was expressly created, named, and made an independent institution and entrenched in the Constitution as independent. Now, if we turn to the next slide, these are the terms of reference that I would like to go through without spending too much time because you can read these for yourself, so I won't read them in, in full. But on this screen, you're seeing the terms of reference, the two overarching terms that were both in the 2020 cabinet decision as well as in the revised one. So basically we are asked to reevaluate the vision of the people of the Virgin Islands as expressed in the preamble to the present constitution and to also evaluate the present constitution itself and to determine whether it is a strategic fit to facilitate the people of the Virgin Islands in achieving this revised vision and then to identify any gaps. Now, the reason I, I read this one out in full is to emphasize that this is our guide in mantra. It is this term here to review the Constitution and to determine if it's still a strategic fit that is our guide in mantra. So we can review anything in the Constitution. However, if we, when we go to the next slide, you'll see that we have been asked to particularly focus on certain things. And I'll just go through these very quickly. One is, for example, on the executive ministerial government. You see there's little, little I. Whether it's working, whether there are things that need to be put in place by way of checks and balance to make the ministerial government more accountable. So in our consultation so far, we've had a lot of recommendations here. Some people have said, that we, we need to use the Referendum Act. We've never had a referendum. Some persons, some are for and some are against term limits, and some are suggesting that you can have um, staggered term limits where you can have a person who can run for a fixed period of time but then must take a break before that person would be eligible again to contest or sit in the House of Assembly or contest a seat. So those, that's just to give you a, a flair for what that means to, because it could be a bit um, foreign to just read this to understand what it's getting at. 
We've also had suggestions for including a provision that recalls, gives the power of recall. So that's the sort of flavor there. We've been asked under the I whether or not independent institutions enshrined in the Constitution, whether they're sufficient to ensure good governance. So here we go, like with the Complaints Commissioner, for example, or the Auditor General. Those are just some examples. We've also been asked to review the powers reserved to the Governor and perhaps to think about some way that this can be devolved to the local government, even if it means not, um, not amending the Constitution or if we have to, but we're asked to look at those reserved powers. So what this means is that the Governor actually has the power to pass legislation independent of the members in the House of Assembly. And the Governor is able to do that if, particularly if that legislation is needed in order to comply with international obligations. Now, if we go to the other slide, we'll see some more of the things we've been asked to the subterms, I call them. So the next slide begins with um, four. Again, a mechanism for the transfer of those reserve powers. And little five, whether there should be a regime in relation to election expenses. Six, whether statutory board should be embedded in the Constitution. And uh, at this point, I could just explain. I think the concern here comes from the Commission of Inquiry report. It's, I suspect it's more or less aimed at having some uniformity in, if, in the standards that boards are um, held to and so that they're accountable, have some sort of uniformity, and also to whether or not those should actually be elevated to the point of including those in the Constitution. Just a caution here I always give, the more things you put in the Constitution, the more you are opening up the government to possible action being taken that things are unconstitutional. So there is a financial um, implication when you do those things. We've been asked to look at whether the speaker should continue to be a political appointment or even if so, whether or not the speaker should be independent of political parties. And then just wrapping up on the next slide, um, section 66 and 67 of the Constitution, those are the sections that essentially say that if you're going to contest a seat or if you're sitting already, you need to declare contracts you have with government. There's some interpretation that this does not include contracts with statutory bodies. So the question is whether that needs to be made clearer. And if it's not clear, whether the um, contracts with statutory bodies should also be disclosed. And the last one, 10, little 10, says, you know, to first to look at the relationship between the ministers and their departments. This comes from section 56 of the Constitution, where it says that the minister is responsible for the administration of his ministry and the departments thereunder. And similarly, it's uh, similarly worded where it talks about the governor. Now, that doesn't mean that the minister runs the ministry because we follow the Westminster system and there the minister is responsible for setting the policy and the public. The permanent secretary should be the one with his or her staff who then carries out that policy. So the question is whether that is clear and what could be done to, to address that. And um, if we turn to the last slide here, one of the terms that we've been asked to look at as well, this is not a subterm, this is a substantive term in itself, is to review the next steps towards self-determination. And I won't spend any more time on this one because we've actually set aside the period after intermission to discuss this one. And then the last one is to consider how best law enforcement and justice agencies can sit within the constitutional framework. So. This is, um, this is usually the background as well that we give when we have our town hall meetings. And so this is the point at which we would 
allow you to ask us questions or if you would like us to clarify anything else at all or anything to re be repeated, we are happy to do that. So we turn it over to you and the audience here as well as in um, the um, Facebook viewers. Okay, we could turn to the next slide, which is um, just to invite you to have an open conversation with us. Thank you very much. Any questions on the Facebook? We open to those as well, or any questions from the audience? Anything anyone would like us to repeat or would like us to speak about? Most pleasant evening, Calvin, Calvin Malone. Um, item F it speaks of how best can you read item F and then have it fully explained so that we can get a full grasp? Because even after looking at it many times, I'm unclear as to exactly what is intended. Mr. Malone, can you read it out? Sure. Item F is uh, to consider how best the law enforcement and justice agencies can sit within the constitutional framework. Um, and just to be further, in the Commission of Inquiry, this was also stated in recommendations B38 through 44, and in the report, they had extensive discussions on this in 12.1 through chapters 137, but I'm unclear as to exactly yes. what okay. we have I, and how best yes. to do fit. Thank so, you. So what happened is after the, um, the Commission of Inquiry made some recommendations, I think their recommendation for, in relation to this topic was very widely drafted. And it was essentially suggesting that this body should conduct a co-review with the review of the law enforcement agencies. And um, it was felt that it just was not clear how the commissioner of inquiry envisage this to happen, how the two reviews could be conducted side by side. And so this wording was a sort of a meeting halfway to give us some authority to look into that matter, but without us actually being required to conduct an investigation or review along with the the other review that's specifically set up for law enforcement. So in other words, this was our attempt to just make that recommendation a bit more mellow um, because there's no way we have the resources to, and, and it wasn't clear how, how would two reviews be conducted and work together in the one year time frame. Okay, great, thank you, because um, 
It came as one of the recommendations from the Commission of Inquiry, and I know that in the recommendations, I'm not sure which one it is, and maybe some of you who have the recommendations can look at it, but it were to, it also suggests that one of the areas of concern, and we've asked about it, is whether or not we should have judge-only trials. I will look in terms of which of the uh, terms were that was specifically stated, and then we need to just be aware of what that says and some of the other recommendations as they came in B38 through 44. Yes. So I will actually look at those and then make sure that we e have yes. a clear understanding. And I'm subject to correction by other commissioners, but I think the a question such as relates to the judge-only trial, I think that could actually fit under the subterm, which asks us to consider independent institutions enshrined in the Constitution, because that would include the judiciary. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give someone else an opportunity. A question from thank you miss smith yes thank you. Uh, a question from facebook um the viewer would like to know where was the origin of the outlined substantive terms and their subsections up for review thank you very much so the original terms were the substantive ones which asked us to 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 evaluate the overall constitution and see if it's a strategic fit as well as the one on self-determination those were all in the original cabinet decision and were the terms that were disseminated with the original appointments so they remain they have not been changed and if you go to our website under about the commission there's actually an article that sets out the original terms from 2020, as well as the amended terms, which I just read out to you, so that you can do a comparison for yourself. Madam Chair, if you could just um, state the website. So the website, the again, it's gonna be on the bottom of all the slides but it's www.yourconstitution.vg. Any further questions? Or remember, we're here to educate as well. What we find happens is once people get talking, then we explain things, and the whole thing becomes very educational and very interesting. If there are no more questions, are there questions on Facebook? Okay, so if there are no more questions on, yes, okay. Good evening. Uh, my, my question is related to, uh... yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, better. Perfect, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my question is related to eligibility of, of belongers to seek public office. Does the current constitution make reference to it? <clears throat> and will there be any revisions in the current review or any consideration for that component of it? Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. So for the benefit of persons who may not um, be as or fay with the difference between uh, a belonger and the difference between citizenship and immigration status. 
If you would bear with me, I would like to explain that first before I answer your question, and because it is relevant to answering your question. But the short answer to your question is that there's actually a provision in the Constitution that defines the term Virgin Islander, which is not used very often. And it, I'll, tell you it's, um, I'll tell you why it's used and when, but that's, that is a section of the Constitution that was put in in 2007 to address that, a certain concern at the time. So just by way of background, the difference between belongers and, and nationality, because we are not an independent country, we are not able to grant nationality. What we can control is immigration status. And so we have a concept of belonger status. It's existing all the overseas territories, they call it different things, we call it belonger status. That's an immigration status. Now, what you get if you would like to have a British Virgin Islands or a Virgin Islands passport, you will have to naturalize to become British if you're not already British. That then entitles you to a passport if you meet the requirements under the British Nationality Act. Those are criteria that are governed by the United Kingdom under the British Nationality Act and are totally out of our control. So you do have this dichotomy where it's very difficult for people to grasp, but you can have a belonger who does not have or is not entitled to a passport because he's not British, and you can have someone who is the holder of a Virgin Islands passport, but who is not a belonger, okay? And that's the reason why. So the terms we deal with locally is belonger. Now, the 2007 Constitution goes a bit further and uses the term Virgin Islander only in very specific circumstances. And I, I'll leave it to my colleagues to go into more detail, but essentially what it does is it says, if you want to be eligible to sit in the House of Assembly and represent the country, and its citizenry, you have to be not only a belonger, but you have to have some ancestral and cultural ties to the Virgin Islands, to the territory. So you've had to, for example, the, the major thing is you've had to have been living here in the territory for the last at least three to five years. And that's the term Virgin Islander. But that is a very bespoke term used only in relation to that. If, you, if your, your question was whether or not there's any plans to review it, it's not for us to tell you what we want. Our job is to put together a report with your recommendations. So if you are not happy with that recommendation, with that existing term, we would encourage you to submit your comment. You can submit your comments online at www.yourconstitution.bg. That answers your question, or it confuses you more? <laughs> well, the, the reason why I have a question is that the, the reason why I have a question is this, and I think this is much like this is the reason why. Can I get my exercise tonight? My 10,000 steps. So the reason for my question really is to, is to understand, as many Virgin Islanders or belongers who are <clears throat> born in the US via, right? I'll use myself as an example. However, I am a belonger. I am a Virgin Islander, according to your definition. However, my, my children, none of which have been born in the Virgin Islands. However, they are belongers. So my question really is, I'm asking on their behalf, are they eligible to run? And would their kids be eligible to run? if and when they want to? So the short answer yeah. to that is no. Okay. Because they would have to, to um, trace their ties back. And we've actually had some of our fellow commissioners who have worked this out, and I think their guesstimation is that it will probably take about two generations to three generations before um, they would be eligible. 
two to three generations. But it's the section, um, we're going to tell you the section sure. now, and maybe you can do the math. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we have our commissioner online, and yeah. she will um, add, add, add some flesh to this for you. Ms. Georges. Okay, I understood the question to be that um, the gentleman is a Virgin Islander by descent, but was born outside of the Virgin Islands, yes? He was born in the U.S. Um, Virgin Islands. That, that's correct, yes. Where were your parents born, if there. you don't mind us asking? That's fine. They are born right here, Bivia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the children that belong us. Okay, so it is section 65. So there are three, there are three, um, there are three wrongs. So a person is qualified if they're born in the Virgin Islands of a father or mother who at the time of birth was a British overseas territory citizen or British dependent territory citizen by virtue of birth in the Virgin Islands or by virtue of descent from a father or mother who was born in the Virgin Islands. So our questioner was not born in the Virgin Islands, so would not qualify under that provision. Born in the Virgin Islands of a father or mother who at the time of birth belonged to the Virgin Islands by birth or descent. Um, our questioner was not in that category, neither would his children born outside of the Virgin Islands fall in that category. And then born outside the Virgin Islands of a father or mother who at the time of birth belong to the Virgin Islands by birth or descent. So the questioner would fall inside that category, and I think uh, his children would also fall inside of that category, but I don't think his grandchildren would fall inside of that category. Okay, and then to be able to run, remember there's the, the requirement that the children must And then there's the, the yes, the, the presence of... living here for the, the residents three to five years, okay? okay. So, so have a look at section 65. 65. Six five. Six five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Six five. Thank right. you. Thank you. That's that's quite uh, helpful. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Oh, and Madam Chair, we can also look at subsection three in sixty five. It, it does say that a person born outside the Virgin Islands mm -hmm. who belongs to the Virgin Islands by descent shall not be qualified to be elected as a member of the House of Assembly unless one of his or her grandparents belong to the Virgin Islands by birth. Thank you. Okay. Honorable Whitley, welcome, and um, good to have you here. Yeah, good evening. It's good to be here, and I greet the esteemed members of the Constitutional Review Commission, as well as those gathered here tonight and those viewing online. Uh, I, I was trying my best to give uh, as many others the opportunity to speak, uh, but since we are a little slow to to, to speak, perhaps I can put some of my views on record, primarily as a citizen of the Virgin Islands. <clears throat> Just to say, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, that the, the most fundamental contradiction that we face in this Constitution and the constitutions before has to do with our non-self-governing status. We have close to 200 countries in the world. Uh, in the world that we live in, we have 17 remaining non-self-governing territories. And based on our obligations to the United Nations, we have to report every year our progress towards decolonization. And we, we can never have a conversation about a constitution without addressing that fundamental contradiction that we, uh, from I guess the laws of some of the most powerful nations on the planet are considered to be almost a property or owned by other nations. 
And the United Nations has said that that reality, which we know as colonialism, is something that must be brought to an end. And for the past five decades, the United Nations have declared that this is the decade to eradicate colonialism. Now, even Sir Gary Hickenbottom, who has written the Commission of Inquiry report, recognizes our aspirations for self-government. And if Sir Gary Hickenbottom can recognize our aspirations for self-government, we ourselves should not be shy to do so. I'll read from the Commission of Inquiry report, recommendation A2. I recommend that there be an early and speedy review of the Constitution with the purpose of ensuring that abuses of the type I have identified do not recur and establishing a constitution that will enable the people of the BVI to meet their aspirations, including those in respect of self-government within the context of a modern democracy. Right now, we only have a partial democracy. We have an individual who is unelected, who has tremendous powers, and the people of the Virgin Islands, the voters, cannot hold that individual accountable. And so it's important for our young persons viewing here tonight, and it's important for the people of the Virgin Islands to know that not, that is not something which is normal. It is not something which is normal and it's not something which is, which is acceptable. And this constitution that we are uh, going through the process of consulting on is a constitution which must see advancement in our aspirations for self-government, as the constitutions before have done. For instance, when it gave us the authority to have our own Minister of Finance, and the other constitutions before that gave us the authority to have ministers of government. This constitution must deliver on very fundamental issues. While we may have some issues which are may be considered peripheral, or not necessarily fundamental, this constitution must deliver on fundamental change as it pertains to our relationship with the United Kingdom government in keeping with international norms and what is moral and acceptable in the world. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think what we will do since there, if no, no questions on Facebook and there are no questions from the audience, we will actually take a two minutes intermission and we will present the second part of the program, which is to do with self-determination. Thank you very much, and um, bear with us for two minutes, and we'll be right back. Thank you.
Visit our website at www.yourconstitution.vg for interesting information and more importantly to post your comments and to book your appointment if you or a group of you would like to schedule an appointment to meet us. Please participate. It is your constitution. The Constitution Review Commission has been established for the purpose of conducting a full review of the Virgin Islands Constitution 2007. The Commission launched its public education campaign on the 1st of November 2022. Please visit our website at www.yourconstitution.vg for interesting information and more importantly to post your comments and to book your appointment if you or a group of you would like to schedule an appointment to meet us. Please participate. It is your constitution. The Constitution Review Commission has been established for the purpose of conducting a full review of the Virgin Islands Constitution 2007. The Commission launched its public education campaign on the 1st of November 2022. Please visit our website at www.yourconstitution.vg for interesting information and more importantly to post your comments and to book your appointment if you or a group of you would like to schedule an appointment to meet us. Please participate. It is your constitution. The Constitution Review Commission has been established for the purpose of conducting a full did you know that our constitution is fundamental law? That means that any law made in the Virgin Islands must be subject to the constitution. The behavior of the executive must be subject to the constitution. And the judiciary has the power to review such laws and actions accordingly. Want to know more? Read some of the court cases and other interesting information on our website at www.yourconstitution.vg. Please participate in the 2022 Constitutional Review. Remember, it's your Constitution. Did you, did you know that the Virgin Islands has had constitutional laws and constitutional reform from as early as 1735? At that time, we had a nominated and legislative council that unfortunately never met. Constitutional law can be founded on a collection of principles, rules, and conventions that need not be codified. The West Indies Act 1962 provides the legal basis for the UK orders and council that set out our modern day constitutions, including the codified and current Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007. Please participate in the 2022 Constitutional Review. Remember, it's your constitution. Did you know that generally fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed under a constitution are not absolute? That's right. Fundamental rights are expressly stated in our constitution to be exercisable subject to the rights of others as well as subject to the public interest grounds. For example, one's right to peacefully assemble is curtailed to the extent that the state takes any action necessary to ensure the safety of the public. Please participate in the 2022 Constitutional Review and visit our website at www.yourconstitution.vg for more interesting information. Remember, it's your Constitution. Did you know that in the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, there are five areas of government reserved to the governor instead of locally elected representatives? These special responsibilities are external affairs, defense including the armed forces, internal security including the police force, the public service, and the administration of the courts. Please share your views on whether these arrangements reflect your vision for the Virgin Islands how issues which arise should be addressed, and a mechanism for transfer of these responsibilities by participating in the 2022 Constitutional Review. 
Visit our website at www.yourconstitution.vg to leave a comment, schedule a meeting with the Review Commission, find out where you can attend a public meeting, or read more information. Participate in the 2022 Constitutional Review. Remember, Maya. it is your Constitution. Maya. Welcome to the second portion of this evening's discussion. I notice that you have not um, felt this, or um, you are not feeling the Christmas spirit because the sp Christmas spirit is not so silent and quiet. Do you want to sing a Christmas carol to get you bouncing? You know, we are all governed by the Constitution, and it is all our responsibility to do what we can to make sure that the Constitution reflects who we are, our aspirations, and our heritage, and so on. And not only for us who are living now, but for the generations to come. So what you are doing tonight is not necessarily for yourself, but for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. So invest in them tonight by making your contribution to this um, discussion. Um, and we will you know, like to hear more from you because we can only report what you um, say. We cannot report what you did not say. Uh, so be willing to share, even if not necessarily tonight, sometime before the, the um, end of the time for closing off the, the um, submissions, and you will hear more about that tonight. So our second section is about self-determination. Now, in general, self-determination is a very wide um, subject. And British Virgin Islanders... Um, have been on the road, on the journey of self-determination ever since emancipation. They have had to struggle through some very trying times and in general, they have had to carve a life out from the rugged terrain and a rugged environment. So, in general, they have been persevering to day to day in various ways. In this particular context where we are tonight, we are only looking at one aspect of self-determination, more or less, and um, that would be the aspect that uh, refers to the constitution status that we have. Now, as was said earlier by the chairperson and I think also by some other commissioner, the, the self-determination is not new. It began, and um, I would like just to give you a few um, historical tidbits on the development of our, um, political self-determination. In 1871, you know, it became a presidency of the Leeward Islands Federation, which was a political unit within the Federation, governed by the commissioner 
and legislative council and an executive council which had no teeth. And in 1902, the territory, lo the, the presidency lost the legislative council. It was taken away by the Leeward Islands Fe Federation. So for 48 years, we did not have um, a legislative council. Then in 1950, the council, the elective legislative council was restored. And um, the franchise only included men 21 years or over. And uh, the presidency as a whole was one electoral district. So the four members who were elected were elected as at large members. So that was the status we had. Then it, in 1953, we got universal suffrage. Women were able to vote. And in 1954, the Constitution and Elections Order introduced the district system where we had five elective members. And two of them, of course, were for district number two. And in 1956, we determined that we were going to leave the Federation and we became a colony in our own right and not as part of the Federation. So the, there were more responsibilities and the status um, had more autonomy. Even though it wasn't a lot of autonomy, it was more autonomy than the presidency. In 1959, the governor of the Leeward Islands was abolished and the administrator was given some more autonomy. I'm doing this just briefly. Then in 1962, the West Indies Act made provisions for the pathway to greater political autonomy. And discussions of the ministerial system became the order of the day. There was a lot of discourse throughout the community about that. And in 1965, you had a similar um, constitution review as we have now, which preceded the 1967 um, introduction of the ministerial system with seven electoral districts. In 1976, the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 1976, you had nine electoral districts, four representatives were recommended for the four large, at large recommended, but they were not introduced, introduced, implemented at that time. It was not implemented until 1993. And then 2007, we had the Virgin Islands Constitution Order, which gave auto more autonomy. 2015, 2015, you had the Virgin Islands Constitution Amendment Order, which provided for junior ministers. And now we are here at that juncture. Where do you want to go? What do you see on the horizon for the territory in terms of our political statement, status, or self-determination. It's a process. So where do you see us going from here? The, the Premier mentioned um, some things, some ideas a while ago uh, when he spoke. And um, I believe from that we can open up our discussion. Um, do not be afraid to say any um, thing that you would like to say in refer reference to what we are talking about. At this particular stage, it was mentioned earlier that we only have, at this moment, partial internal self-government. That's where we are right now. So you, do you want to respond to that in any way? I'm trying to give everyone a chance. I have a lot to say, but everyone has a mouth. Okay, so then well, perhaps what we could do is then go to the next slide on the United Nations Charter. Sure, or? I would like to. Thank you very much. 
Since we're on Facebook, I would like to um, be able to thank the commission for taking the step in terms of carrying this light because the, when they're replayed in the comfort of person's home, then you would see the number of views and folks all through the world will be able to um, get a chance to view this in the comfort of their own homes, wherever they are. So I'd like to thank you very much for um, having this particular opportunity. I would like to encourage, because um, I'm sitting there and the many chats that I'm in, I'm asking for everyone to um, put the comments on Facebook so it can be read and it can be shared. So it is very critical that we do. As we go through the different phase that you may have, I'm going to stand from time to time to offer some views that I've also been getting from different forums. The concept, and the, this is one which was um, stated earlier, but this is a good time to state it again. It is felt, and we can see this, that a timeline for a referendum to be conducted to decide on the form of political advancement required by the population, inclusive of becoming a unitary, sovereign, democratic state, with the monarchy to remain, or, the, or, or his majesty, to remain as head of state in the first instance, and the nomination and selection of a Virgin Islander um, as Governor General. The effective date would be stated in that referendum as the Premier had indicated, United Nations Charter have sought to, I think the goalposts have been moving, they're saying now by 2030, uh, to have the remaining 17 territories, countries, um, to be self-governing. I think that this is critical because, as you have mentioned um, in some of the areas, self-governance, and I think that it was mentioned here, self-determination, sorry, is not fully equated with independence. There are different forms. If you determined that you want nothing else other than what you have, you have self-determined to be associated, to have independence and others. And I think that that conversation is um, key and keen in terms of a full conversation because we cannot kick that can down the road. And there will be a lot more to be said about that. But before I sit and open up that discussion, I invite everyone here to please come to the mic and state your concern on any of the issue. Not only what is listed as the chairperson have indicated, but any areas in the Constitution. I'm going to read one statement, if you allow me. The people of the Virgin Islands do not trust governance of our people by our people, and therefore are demanding measures that can be enshrined in the new constitution to give the greatest assurance that transparency, accountability, and good governance can be practiced and monitored with consequences for non-adherence. Referendum, recall, and term limits are three powers reserved to enable the voters to petition, to propose, or to repeal legislations, or to remove an elected official from office. A referendum in any, is any question, issue, or act referred to a vote of the people by the House of Assembly, or a petition from voters as authorized by law. Notwithstanding the existence of a referendum act on the books of the Virgin Islands, it is recommended, or it is, it is to be discussed whether or not provisions for referendums should be examined with a view of establishing specific guidelines that would be embedded in the Constitution. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a good opportunity now for us to segue into the slides. And if we could pick up at slide 14, which is um, would give an overview of the United Nations Charter and go on to discuss some things that flow from it. I think it would be helpful for our Facebook viewers and our audience to be able to actually see the text and the main areas that are off-cited, often cited, and, um, and then we can open up the discussion after our presentation. Good evening. So, <clears throat> members um, of the commission um, and to our um, audience in-house and on Facebook, we would have all heard um, reference to the United Kingdom's obligations um, referred to earlier by um, two speakers, the Honorable um, Premier and also the Honorable At-Large Member, Honorable Malone. Um, the reference there is being made to Article 73 of the United Nations Charter. And for persons who do not know, the United Nations Charter is the founding document of the United Nations and came into effect in October 1945. Now, the purpose of the United Nations is essentially um, coming out of, you know, post-World War II, um, you know, you had the United Nations with the aim of maintaining international peace and security, preventing um, threats and aggression, you know, from other countries to smaller countries, etc. And of course, within that is to develop and maintain friendly relations among nations based on the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. Now, under Article 73 of the United Nations Charter, members of the United Nations, of which the United Kingdom is a founding member, have certain responsibilities in relation to non-self-governing territories. And those responsibilities they are on the slides, um, and I'll go through them quickly because I think it's important to ensure their just treatment and protection against abuses, to develop self-government and to take account of the political aspiration of the peoples, to further international peace and security, to promote constructive measures for development, and then to report and to issue periodic reports to um, the Secretary General for the United Nations on the progress that's been made in relation to those aims. Now, if you look at B, and we have it highlighted, the political aspirations of the peoples, and that's highlighted because I think it's important because it presupposes that it is what the people want Next slide, please. So there should be a mechanism for taking the temperature of the people as it were. So um, as was mentioned earlier, we are here. We have partial internal self-government. And the question is, as we continue along the road to self-determination, what do we now want? You would have heard Honorable Malone give a suggestion, and that is a referendum. That is one mechanism by which persons can give their views on, in turn, um, you know, as we progress um, down the road to self-determination, whatever that is or whatever that looks like. Now, in the Caribbean region, um, there are five overseas territories of the United Kingdom, former colonies, now referred to as overseas territories. The British Virgin Islands is one, um, or the Virgin Islands. The last um, country in the 
Caribbean region to go independent was St. and Nevis in 1983, Antigua and Barbuda before that in 81. And this followed Jamaica and Trinidad um, in about August 1962. So for nearly 30 years, the status quo as it pertains to the five remaining overseas territories have remained firm. Now, Bermuda in the mid 1990s had a referendum on independence and that referendum actually on the question of whether or not Bermuda should pursue independence. At the time, that um, the answer was no. So Bermuda, um, of the remaining UK overseas territories in the Caribbean region, and I say Caribbean region because we know that, you know, my geography teacher would be angry at me if I didn't acknowledge that the talks in Caicos and Bermuda are not in the Caribbean, strictly speaking. But um, in the Caribbean region, we've not had any, I suppose, movement forward in terms of um, going straight to independence or any express will of the people. Now, we've been moving forward. You would have heard um, some of the notable changes and advancements that would have occurred in our 2007 constitution. So we have been continuing along the road, yes, to self-determination, but there has not been the question of whether we want to go all the way to independence. Um, in any of the territories, save for Bermuda, who has arguably the most advanced constitution of the overseas territories. It's often referred to as a pre-independence constitution by some academics. So Bermuda has the most advanced of all the remaining um, overseas territories in this region. Next slide, please. What has the UK said? Um, the UK's position um, has been summed up, and as far as I know, it still remains the same. Um, there was a white paper in 2012 called the Overseas Territories Security, Success, and Sustainability. And what the UK's position has been, and as far as I am aware, continues to be, that any decision to sever the constitutional link between the UK and the Overseas Territories should be on the basis of the clear and constitutionally expressed will, wish of the people of the territory. And where independence is an option and it is clear and the constitutionally expressed wish of the people, the UK government will meet its obligations to help the territory achieve it. Now, pausing there just for a moment. So we know that under the United Nations Charter, it is an actual obligation on the UK for its, um, well, at that time, you know, much of, um, you know, the Caribbean, Africa, probably, and India and so forth in 1945 would have been non-self-governing. Um, and then over the ensuing decades, you would have had, you know, from India to many nations in Africa and, and much of the Caribbean going towards independence. And what you have now is, as you would have heard, about 17 remaining. And the obligation of the UK is to continue to assist those remaining territories with their, on the path to full internal self-government or independence. The UK has, in response to that, and there have been subsequent um, international treaties and so forth that give other options. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things that the UK has said and has consistently said, that obligation will be met if it is the express wish of the people. Next slide, please. So coming out of that, there are some options, and I'll give you three because there are more, um, you know, and 
Honorable Malone s stated it um, best when he said, you know, one part of self-determining is, is possibly deciding that you're content in the relationship that you have right now and do not wish to alter that relationship. Um, but there are th options available, and those options are for you to consider and give us feedback on. Um, of course, independence is an option which would mean full internal self-government. There's also the option of integration. Um, and just to give you an example of that, um, one of the commissioners recently, um, in describing what in integration looks like, um, mentioned visiting Guadeloupe. And, you know, she was very shocked when the immigration officer said to her, welcome to France. So that is what integration looks like, where the territory is actually subsumed within the administering power, as it's referred to in um, the United Nations Charter. And there's also free association. That is another option, and free association could be with the UK or some other sovereign country. Um, of course, free association assumes, you know, bilateral, a bilateral relationship, so there's no way to know whether or not um, that would be acquiesced from, you know, the UK if, or the terms, because that would be subject to an agreement. But those are options, and there are others. So as we continue along the path to... Um, self-determination and figuring out what we want. We have had, over the last two constitutions at least, progressive steps. We have taken progressive steps along that road. And um, we are hoping out of this exercise that we would continue um, to move along that path. Next slide, please. Now, some of the things that we would have to do as we consider these questions are to delve into our readiness. Delve into our readiness to see whether or not we can or we are ready to take the next step. Um, so a full assessment of where we are and how ready we are to take the next step um, is one of the things that should be considered. Taking the temperature of the populace on the question, finding out what the clear will of the people is on the question, do we do that via a referendum or is it something that would come from a general election mandate? And a general election mandate for persons um, who would want that clarified is essentially um, if a candidate or a party were to campaign um, with independence as or whatever form of advancement towards self-determination. If a particular party was to campaign on that particular mandate and that party were to come to power, we would expect that the mandate be implemented. Is that sufficient for your purposes? Or are you willing to only have it through referendum? Those are questions that would need to be answered. Of course, a cost-benefit analysis, and of course, how and when we would begin to roll back some of the powers that are now devolved to the governor or um, the special responsibilities that are reserved to the governor or the special responsibilities that the governor has. How and the mechanism by which that would be dissolved, devolved sorry, to our elected representatives or local persons on island, whether they be the elected government or elected in, um, independent institutions on island. So we, I know that that has been a mouthful. Um, Dr. Whitley has been here, and we're going to go over some of what we just covered again. So Dr. Whitley was actually reminding me that I need to pause for questions and so forth. So we're going to step backwards um, to give clarity if it's needed. OK. 
okay, if, if I may. Uh, just to say, I, you know, I think I thought that was a, a very good uh, summation of where we are as it pertains to self-determination. But I also wanted um, to add a few pointers in terms of uh, when we consider next steps. One is I think we really need to educate the public in terms of what are the things that the United Kingdom government does for us or do for us? What do they do for us? I think it would be instructive in persons when they're considering self-determination. Uh, we, we recognize the fact that persons need to be educated on these things. And some persons may believe that despite you know, what we've told persons at various instances, some persons may believe that the United Kingdom gives us some money or something like that. Like they give us some grants. Or they may believe that, um, let's, let's take um, um, Hurricane Orma. Uh, probably prior to Hurricane Orma, they may think that the, the, the United Kingdom government would give us a, a big grant. And what is more likely is that nations who have a less per capita income would get those big grants. And despite our relationship with the United Kingdom government, we won't get those big grants because of the OECD rules as it pertains to um, ODA or, 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 or overseas direct assistance. Uh, so it's important for persons to understand those things, that if you go the route, and, and independence is not the only route, of course, but let's say you go independent, uh, you can still keep the legal system that you have now. You can still keep the Privy Council as your final court of appeal. You know, persons need to understand these things because perhaps maybe they feel if you, if, if you take that particular step, there'll be some fundamental shift that will hurt you in some way. And persons need to be educated about those type of things so that they can properly consider next steps. Let's, let's take a look at the assessment of readiness. Persons must consider whether we are less in a state of readiness in 2022 than Jamaica was in 1960, was it 1961 or 1962? One of the two. 1962. Or St. Kitts in 1983 or Antigua in 1981. Uh, is our economy right now stronger than those economies would have been back then, I'm not sure uh, um, completely, but I know we have a thriving financial services sector. We have a thriving tourism sector. We have, uh, we, we considered middle income country with a very decent uh, income per capita. Not to say that we don't have our challenges, but are we really that far behind all the other independent countries uh, in Africa and the Caribbean and the Middle East, etc. At the time, at the time when they became self-governing, I think it's important for persons to consider that. Um, I also wish to comment on the cost-benefit analysis um, and just to say um, that. Uh, my father, Douglas Wheatley, he, he, he did a report on that and it should form, I'm not sure if it was ever formally laid on the table of the House of Assembly. Uh, but it should form a reference for persons if they want to know what are the costs and the obligations of independence. And of course that was done uh, many years ago, so perhaps the information needs to be uh, updated. And certainly, uh, I'll 
comment on the last point that's there, the rollback of most, not all powers reserved to the governor. Uh, uh, for me, uh, the, the, United, the United Kingdom's position that independence or nothing else is one that we have to be willing to challenge. We have to be willing to challenge this concept that, that you cannot have a pre-independence constitution. Or you have to challenge that you'll have no further um, progress in your constitutions outside of independence. Uh, that's something that we have to challenge because that's contrary to what the United Nations has said. Uh, and of course, I think you may need to examine, I said you, we may need to examine, uh, we may need to contemplate where we'd be comfortable with having a constitution where we were able to roll back the powers of the governor before taking that final step to wherever where we want to go. Because that's a step in preparation that would help persons feel more comfortable uh, in taking a, a step forward without taking what they may consider to be the ultimate step. So all of those things I think is good for persons to consider uh, when taking a look at uh, next steps. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Wheatley. Can, can you um, not sit as yet? I want to just ask you a clarification. When you say that we need to challenge the UK's position of independence or nothing, so in other words, you move out or you stay home, put it in colloquial language, are you referring to the 1960 declaration or are you referring to section 73? Well, uh, the, the UK had some particular forum that I don't remember. So perhaps one of the commissioners would be able to remind me. They declare that um, the, the, I believe it, as it pertains to uh, their position on the, on the decolonization committee correct uh, that they were quite comfortable um, with their relationship with their um, territories and if the territories expressed that they wanted to become independent they will support it but um, they, they want they, they, they were not considering uh, free association okay thank or, you or integration not yes. to say that I favor integration, I don't, but I think free association is one that we need to think more, more um, carefully about because in free association, you're able to define the relationship between, you have two states which are able to define a relationship between um, each other and, and each one would accept the terms, which is fundamentally more uh, democratic in my view and you can have a relationship just based on security if you like but that's if the united kingdom wants that because free association as the commissioner said in the presentation it assumes both sides would agree uh, i certainly agree and i think that we would have to consider um, what if the united kingdom doesn't want that type of relationship with us whether we would want to have it, that type of relationship with another um, state. Okay. And I think that's something that we have to think about. And I think sometimes, honestly, the relationship that we have is taken for granted. It's almost taken for granted that perhaps um, the, 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 the Caribbean itself is the realm of the United Kingdom or uh, the United States of America. And I don't think they should take those things for granted because there are advantages the advantages to having these type of partnerships and relationships. And I think if, if, if one side only sees the advantages on, one, on the other side, that the, or the advantages are only one way, we, we, we limit ourselves in terms of our negotiation. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, any comments from Facebook before Honorable Malone takes the mic? He's accustomed to this. And any, Ms. Smith? Oh, uh, just, just a minute. Can we hear the comments? Malone, Mr. Malone, give us a, bear with us a second, please.
before. There's, uh, there's agreement with the Premier's comments. Um, one individual said we want to vote for the Deputy Governor. Uh, one said I would like to see all who want to run for Premier be voted for separately. Also two term limits for Premier and three term limits for all other Senators. I also agree with vo voting for the Deputy Governor. An individual, we are being punished for what Bermuda did with their constitution. And again, uh, agreement with the Honorable Premier. Okay, thank you very much for that. Just for the benefit of people who may not understand that last reference to Bermuda, the Bermuda had indicated, as I understand it, that it would have been seeking independence. And I believe that on the basis of that, it perhaps then secured the constitution that it has now. And the question is whether then the, um, the resistance to the UK or the hard line that the, that the Premier is referring to that the UK is taking is whether perhaps that is, is um, because of the, Bermuda's ex of the Bermuda experience, because as you know, Bermuda has not gone independent as yet. So that's just to clarify for the benefit of persons who may not have understood that last comment. Um, if no more questions or comments from there, um, Mr. Malone, bear with us another second. Um, Mr. Skelton, you wanted to say. Dr. Whitley, Dr. Whitley and then Mr. Skelton and then, um, and then to the floor. Thank you. My comment is going to be a, a, along the line of education um, of our people. Um, one of the difficulties we have had so far in going around is many of the persons we've come in contact with have not read the Constitution and um, they really have not had you know, much exposure to it um, and other elements. So if we, um, while we are thinking about moving on to another stage in um, our self-determination, on our self-determination journey, keep in mind that it is imperative that we also make sure that our, the consciousness of our people is heightened education-wise, not... Um, uh, academic only, but education in general, so that um, they are really in tune with what um, is happening because the Constitution is their guide in life, uh, in the territory, and they need to understand uh, really how it affects their lives. And it is something that affects all of us. So I would just like to throw out that um, because I think uh, we need, we have not been paying as much attention to that um, aspect of the whole determination, self-determination as we should. And so that, that's the reason why a number of you are not and even mentioning too much tonight because you have not really devoted enough time in studying the documents to your own, to really give informed um, comments but you still have time to do that. So collect the documents tonight, look at them, read them, and maybe you have some opinions that you would like to submit, and you will hear more about when, how you can submit those. Thank you very much, Dr. Whitley. Mr. Skelton? Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, we're here to try to educate, especially those young people who probably don't understand how we get where we are. Madam, Sp Madam Chair, we, we uh, the, the, the Premier and the member Lodge just taking a snapshot in time of where we are now in arguing for the next step. But Dr. Wheatley in his presentation mentioned 
some of the, the, the steps that were taken. Madam, Madam, Madam um, Chair, every time this country's constitution was advanced, or people in our country advanced, in 1967, Madam Chair, we had no education, no, no, not no education, no secondary com comprehensive edu education. We had no electricity. We had no hospital that make, that were able to help our people properly. In 1967, we got a constitution and all of those things changed. We had the electricity expansion throughout the Virgin Islands, all the way to, to Virgin Gordo. We had comprehensive secondary education for everybody. Before then, only 25 or 27 kids were able to go to a year to go to, to secondary school. All of us had go, went to seventh standard and they went to learn a trade or if they, if they had families in the U.S. Virgin Islands or in the States, they were able to go overseas and be educated. With the help of, I think it's the Canadian government, we were able to, to really had a secondary high school. And this because of our elected leader, leaders at the time went out to do what needs to be done in the interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. Electricity was the same thing. We had to raise, at that time they raised funds, the ventures in order to bail out the electricity system, which we had to pay for. All of these things were paid for. The healthcare system, and this, along the same time, they took a, a bump up, and our people were, were able to get decent health care based on, on the time. In 1976, more power was given to the elected officials, and we see another bump. That's when we got the finance under our control, and we were able to get the economy moving strongly to, in order to educate more of our people. Today we have a college. We have, and before this, we were sending hundreds of kids overseas to get bachelor's and master's degrees. Then in 2007, which was the last constitution, Advance, man. I was on one of those. I was on the committee, and the British government basically make it quite clear that I think this is it. You need to make a decision. We had disasters in 2007, 2017, so we were not able to take the next steps to move our country forward. But between then and now, we hit a bump in the road, a serious bump. That, act, that is causing us to look at our systems and our institution in a very critical way. Because we can't, we can't make the next step unless we fix some of these stuff for the protection of our people and our institutions. So we are here. And history is proven that every time elected officials got, the country got more autonomy, the country advances. There, was, there were a lot of people who came to live among us who probably don't understand this. But this is something that they need to understand and so we can move forward. Yes, we need to put checks and balances in place. They should have been in place already but they're not there, so let us put them in place, and let us take the next step. Because the next step is important for the development of our country. And in today's world all over the globe, you can't just have somebody appointed with unlimited powers. On, on one breath, Madam, Ch Madam Chair, the COI is saying that the elected official cannot have discretionary powers. They need to, it needs to be controlled, it needs to be used in whatever 
regulations and stuff. But in the same breath, the, the British government, through the Privy Council, give their representative the right to make a major decision on the country using discretionary powers. So he says that we're playing, we're playing with two different set of marbles. So Madam Chair, it is important for the young people and the people who live among us understand that we need to build a country and every step of the way you're gonna have, you're gonna have people, bad people, the wicked people who are gonna do wrong things, but that should not stop you from building a country. So Madam Chair, with those few words, I will. Thank you for that. So I think your, your point is when you say to take the next step, you, you're actually referring to advanced constitutional development, regardless of what form it takes, but to move on, to move forward. Yes, Honorable Malone. If nothing else on Facebook, Honorable Malone. Um, I'm checking, but I haven't seen any. Okay. But Honorable Skelton, uh, I, you know, he's a pastor as a leader, and I like the way, I like the tone he set for me coming, so it wouldn't seem as if I, um, I just started it. Because I made a note just to be resolute and sure about what I'm going to say. There are social, economic, and political storms on our horizon. Do they match the calm in the territory? There's a calm in the territory, a scary calm in the territory. There are difficult and uncomfortable discussions that must be had. I have resolved and based on a number of conversations that the commission itself would not be able to, quote unquote, go much further than what Honorable Skelton basically have outlined. Because your job is to hear the views of the people and I think that is a proper way in which to do it. But does the calm in the territory match the storms that are on the horizon? Let's see. The Honorable Premier spoke of this letter concerning the decolonization committee. But that letter went further. The letter stated that we don't wish to actively participate any further because as far as we have assessed, none of the territories are quote unquote demanding, nor do they wish to have further political, and this is a 1986 letter, eh? do they wish to have further political um, movement? So we don't think that you should be encouraging them to do what they wish not to do. I'm not sure where that, um, where that um, referendum was taken to reach that type of conclusion. But what are we faced with? Because there are some uncomfortable discussions that we must have. I'll first state that some of the concerns that our citizens have is, um, and I think that you can help with this one, they want to know is that if we were to go independent, would we still have the usage, legal tender of the U.S. dollar? I put that there and you can, you can help them with that because I help in my um, unprofessional way. Now, my answer to them is yes. But you can state what process we may have to go through so that it can ease their mind. The other concern is um, the, the um, comfortable relationship that they have with the U.S. as it relates to travel to the Virgin Islands and to the mainland. Would that be hampered? They want to know if defense, what, what, particular, um, what, what particular provisions 
would have to be put in place as it relates to external threats that you have. You can help them with that. But we have some other examples of this concept of if the referendum states that the people of the Virgin Islands wish to move further, they will be prepared with open arms to assist. We have to measure that. Um, we have a different status than, say, Scotland. But I, turn in, I tune in every Wednesday morning to see the challenges that they have even to get allowance for a referendum because they say we are better together. So we're not even letting you go there because we had one, I'm not sure whether it's five years or ten years ago. Not understanding or not being prepared to come to the conclusion that Brexit happened. And they have seen themselves as a new substantial event took place. And they want the opportunity to, to, to self-determine. And they want to take it to a referendum, but they're fighting even to get it there. So when we reach to that fork in the road, would we have similar challenges, even if we take it to a referendum? I don't, particularly me, and this is just my view, I don't think that it should be left to just 13 legislators getting in the room and deciding, well, um, um, seven out of the 13 say yes and we should go. I believe it should be a clear referendum for it. We have the concept again in terms of this order in council being held in reserve. It is criminal, disingenuous, not right that we have this order in council that is a live document sitting on the dressing table of someone who has the single power to put it into effect if they feel that any of the remaining 48 items are not adhered to it is criminal, unjust, that we are on the eve of a general election and not knowing whether we are having one because of this very same order in council. It is criminal, unjust, that we can have an election, choose a new government, and then still have the order in council which could be enforced the month after. These are real issues, uncomfortable, yes, but real. And does the calm match the storms that is immediately ahead of us is what we have to determine. You can't say it, but I think that we must bring it clear to us, because um, I think ZBBI played back some interview I had, which stated the same thing that Honorable Skelton have just stated. 62, we were offered the opportunity to go, and I think wisely we did not. But what did we do in the interim? We got the U.S. dollar as a tender. We built our financial services sector. We went and built a whole tourism sector with the yachting. We built our airports, we built our roads, we built our hospitals, we built our primary school, secondary school, tertiary education. We built our health systems. We built all of these, all through the particular term. And for us to be the only ones saying that we are not ready, there is a deadly calm in the midst of storms. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mr. Malone. Uh, you quite rightly said there are things you can say that we, we cannot say. Our mandate is clear. We stick to our terms of engagement and we, 
we are supposed to be politically neutral. So we leave certain things for other people. We encourage members of the public to get together, do their, their education, and to submit their comments. I know that there's a question, but before I get to that question, I think it might be an appropriate time since Mr. Malone asked to end with the last slide, if you can load slide number 19. Is it up? Is uh, slide 19. Can you put the slide 19? Facebook isn't showing it. It begins with um, Into the Future. Okay, thank you very much. So this is the last slide we had here. It was just basically to wrap the subject up. And I want to reiterate, we've, we meet a challenge when we go out to the consultative sessions because Persons are equating self-determination with independence. And this is one of the things we want to emphasize here, that self-determination is not synonymous with independence. It is, we are self-determining all the time. We've been self-determining from 1735. Now, to just again underscore uh, Mr. Skelton's point, the next constitutional advancement, that will be self-determination as well. We continue to self-determine. It does not mean that we jump from partial internal self-government to what we have to independence. There's a big gap in between there, and I think we need to be clear. At some point, however, if we do become independent or we do consider it, we created this checklist here, and this is um, segue, Mr. Malone's question segues into this slide, so I ask for it to be brought up. To become independent, if you follow what has happened in the past with other Caribbean territories, you would usually expect to see an act of the United Kingdom given independence. It would be setting out the, the routes and laying the framework for independence. At that stage, we probably would have what is a pre-independence constitution or full internal self-government, not where we are at the moment, which is partial internal self-government. So you would have full internal self-government, which would lead to a pre-independence constitution, and you would have to prepare, well, an independence constitution. And that one you won't be reviewing every 10 years. That would be truly a supreme document. You would have to transfer sovereignty. So for instance, there are treaties that the United Kingdom have signed on our behalf, and we, we party to them by extension. That will be no longer. Those treaties would be transferred to us, or we would have to enter into those treaties and negotiate them on our own. You would have your own passport, you would have to define your citizenship, you would need consular assistance, you would need to provide for your defense and security, whether you want to have a model where other people, you pay other people to, to provide the defense, um, you will have to apply for membership in international bodies, including the Commonwealth. There's no free pass because you hitherto or would have been a British overseas territory. And then you, of course, have trade. This is just a list that we did, and it's really, that's why we said it's for the longer term. Um, so the next slide is just basically, if you go to the next slide, we encourage further discussion on it, and um, 
the, we have a question from the audience which we are able to take now. I thought it was um, this gentleman over here first and then Mr. Smith. Good evening. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd like a bit of clarity from the commissioners. I have my 13 and 14 year old with me listening to the, the, to the, um, the discussion tonight and I wanted some clarity for them on the whole matter of the distinction between the Constitution and standing orders. And then I'll ask my question after. Mr. Skelton looked at me and I looked at him. <laughs> so, other commissioners would chip in, but since I have the mic, the Constitution is the document that governs the relationship between the state and its peoples. The standing orders is a document that sets out the procedure that the House of Assembly, this is a legislative arm in the Constitution. Standing orders is the document that sets out how that legislative arm, that body, would conduct its business. Thank you for that. Now my question. One of the things that was in your terms of reference is the whole matter of accountability and how do we want to set the stage moving forward. The challenge and the difficulty that I think we face um, centers around the distinction or bridging the gap between the execution of the standing orders to remain in line with the Constitution. So my question um, really stems as it relates from the angle of finance, Section 8, I think, in the, in, the, um, in the Constitution, on whether or not we need to advance areas from the standing order that gives the standing orders more um, strength and more teeth where it, can be now be in, where it can now be embedded in the Constitution. For example... The whole matter, there are five items that I came up with when I reviewed this whole segment and the whole discussion around finance. Misuse, abuse of power, accountability, governance, and enforcement. So one of the committees that I think about is the whole co the, the committee of the, what I think uh, members of government refer to as PAC, Public Accounts Committee. How do we strengthen that committee from the perspective that persons that hold um, elected office are held to a higher standard and it's no longer just a standing order, it is actually embedded in the Constitution whereby you have to adhere to it. Because I think if we're talking about continuing the journey of self-determination, self-governance, we have to continue demonstrating to the global community that we will hold our own selves accountable more so than just saying we will hold ourselves accountable. What are we putting in place that says we will hold ourselves accountable at all costs? Because I think that's where we begin to demonstrate, not just talk, but demonstrate that we are serious about being accountable for our actions. So that's one. Um, my good colleague and, and friend, uh, Mr. Malone, talk about um, the, I, I, think, I think you used the term, there, there is, um, Challenges or what is the term used? Coming, coming. Oh, yeah, there, there, there are storms brewing. The Constitution makes reference in Section 8 about the consolidation fund and pensions, which I happen to know a little bit about. Um, it should be drawn on that or a pension fund. One of the areas that we have to be very careful, and this is something members or the commissioners is very much aware of. For the last 20 to 30 years, we've talked about the whole concept of the government pension fund. That is a problem that has been waiting to explode. And if we don't address it at some point where it is separated from the drawing on the consolidation fund, we are going to impact the citizens of this country where we cannot afford to pay them. So if we are now saying that we want to advance in certain areas, I think, again, from my point earlier, from a financial point of view, how do we strengthen the Constitution that enforces or feeds the standing orders 
that the persons who are charged with the responsibilities of carrying out the standard orders comply with the constitution we have in place. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. If there are no further questions right now, there are three comments that... Yeah, there uh, is a, a further question, but go ahead. Yeah, there are three comments that um, we have done. So I'm going to let Mr. Smith go ahead because I forgot you had said. Mr. Smith, please go ahead. Okay, before Mr. Smith, any of the commissioners wanted to address the standing orders? It is in the Constitution. 72 and 117. So, um, I, I don't think I need to tell Mr. Faulkner that, but I just, I think he's, he knows it already. Madam Chair, um, the explanation you gave um, is, is the correct one. The Constitution states someplace in it, um, se section that the legislature will make, make its own rules for it to, for, for, the conduct, for it to conduct its own business. Now, it is true that the, the, the rules probably need to be, if we're going to take the next set steps, we, we, we need to strengthen the standing orders. I think putting every single thing in the Constitution will, will probably be worse than not, you know, making, making mention of them in the Constitution and subject those things to... To, to local laws, and those local laws need to be stringent enough to accomplish what we as a people want to accomplish in terms of, you mentioned, the, the holding ourselves to the to international standards that we will all abide by. Yes, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Skelton. Thank you and good night. I sat and I listened quite attentively and there are a few comments which I, I, I wish to make. Um, where the slide prior to this one was talking about whether we um, proceed with a referendum or a political party brings in their mandate for um, self-governance. I think both can work. Um, if I, I would suggest that even if a party bring it on their mandate, they could have the country put on, um, put a referendum towards it, um, which I think might be a good thing. I also, as I, I sat and listened to the discussion, where we, we, we're talking about self-governance and looking at our situation. And we talk a lot about accountability and we have to hold ourselves accountable. If we have a constitution, a constitution is a document which gives you the ability or affords you the ability to make laws under the constitution. The BVI has not been short on making laws, but in my humble opinion where we fell short is the more laws we make, we haven't had the relevant agencies or system put in place to hold whoever needs to be held accountable under those laws. So if we're gonna proceed with making more laws, then we have to see how we are further going to strengthen our capacity for enforcement of the laws. The other issue I have with our constitutional, constitutional review is that while we are talking about moving forward, I am yet to hear someone mention if we're going to move forward with, with, with our self-governance advancement, people need to trust the persons who are in position to do so. And if we don't have persons in the position that you trust to do that, 
then that is why we're going to have the upheaval that we're having and the hesitancy in our community with respect to constitutional advancement and self-governance. And, and that, I feel, is the crux of the matter. People can talk all they want, but if people don't trust you to be their leaders and to lead them in the path, and we see this out in the Bible how leaders were appointed. And if people don't trust you to lead them or trust your leadership, then they're not going to follow. And I wholeheartedly agree, well, yes, we need to educate our, pop our population. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So we have heard a number of those comments before. We have heard the comment that, you know, if you're going to negotiate, you need to see, say what you have done and how you will be accountable for the areas where the UK might say you have fallen short. We have heard the repeated cry for civics to be taught in our schools. Um, so a number of these comments uh, um, repeating themselves, they're recurring comments. So thank you for that. We're going to try and close in um, after this segment because I think it would be a good time for us to close off. It'll be a little bit over two hours. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, we have an active youth chat, um, and they've asked that please read my comment at the forum, and I, and I will read it. Thank you for making this forum available for the people of the territory. The UK, by representation through the governor, has expressed their intention, um, that their intention is to act for the betterment of the people of the territory in light of dissatisfaction the people have expressed in lost confidence of its some local governing representatives. However, Parliament openly forces the issue of public registers for beneficial ownership that they intend to set the standards or pace in enacting these measures. I do not recall the governor holding public forums to know what the positions of the people in this regard. I believe that this forcefully approach by the UK need to be dramatically, need to dramatically shift to a more supportive role that undergirds the people of the territory, the working regime towards self-governance. Yes. So, yeah, I'll send that to you so you can put yeah, that Yes, so in. just for the benefit, this is a constitutional review, so we got to pull that back to the relevance to the Constitution. That's correct. So the relevance to the Constitution there is that the, the requirement for beneficial ownership registers is actually one that is rooted in a United Kingdom Act of Parliament, not a local law. It's the United in Kingdom Act of Parliament called the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act. In that act, it says that countries that did overseas territories that did not have a register of beneficial ownership by 2020, then for those countries, the United Kingdom would make an ordering council directing it. So constitutional relevance here is that the United Kingdom, through the governor, has reserved powers, and also the United Kingdom in its own right, the king, I suppose is the correct word, at the very last paragraph in our constitution, there's power also reserved to the king to make laws for the territory. So because of our status as an overseas territory, the United Kingdom is able to make powers, sorry, is able to make laws for the territory. And, and that I just have to explain the relevance to the exercise for the benefit of persons who may not. Thank be you for that. Aware. And um, okay. they will offer more because of um, soliciting the views. Uh, the other viewers is, uh, they said that Dr. Whitley pointed out that persons may not be able to contribute because they may not have read the documents. But we are talking about ordinary people reading stature 
So we also have to consider who may not have read it because they are intimidated by, by reading the very cumbersome laws. And some may have read but have difficulty understanding the statutory language. So there is definitely room for education and perhaps even the need to extend the time frame for public education and consultation. That's one view. Okay, so we've been doing this from the 1st of November, and we did make that um, pellucidly clear. We said we would have included, we would have considered at the time, we thought we would have been able to, to conduct the public consultation period by the middle of December. We have lost, we will lose two weeks in December. We will make up for those in January. So that will be it. Persons are free to submit their comments, as I said, until after January. The reality is we've, at the end of January, that will be three months. Um, a number of persons are getting the hang of it. They're understanding, they're educated, they are enlightened, and they are in turn forming groups and enlightening others. But if comments come to us after January, then you are just running the risk that it probably would lose a bit of priority. So we would suggest that persons get their comments to us before January. We have to turn our attention to, to writing the report. Perhaps this is a, a reason why perhaps the government should consider civics in the school, because we hear that comment all the time that, that um, you know, in the U.S. you're taught about your constitution, you're taught about these things, and here you, you're not taught about your constitution, you're not taught, taught about your local history, and so it is a challenge when you have to, you know, ask people to, to give their comments because it's the first time a number of persons have been exposed to this. Well, this is one of the difficult conversations, and this, and this comment is not for you, and don't, not anyone take it personal. The original, in 2020, it was perceived that we'll have two years for this exercise. We had a commission of inquiry that took place 444 days. They had 30 days to agree to all of the recommendations. They they said that the commission had to be in place by the first, I think it is, either the 31st of July or the 1st of July. It came to the House of Assembly on, in September, I think it was 20th. You started your review, public consultation in, in, in actually November, moved it from closing off mid-December to January, hopefully. But I respectfully submit that the time frame given to you, given to the people, is unfair. But that is just to throw out there. Don't take it personal, but it is grossly unfair. Uh, the other point, BVI people need to give themselves credit for what they have achieved. Too often, we are allowing people to speak about us like we are unable or incapable, and we adopt the narrative. Almost everything we see around us, we have built. We have been off grant and aid since 1978. So we need to have confidence in ourselves and give ourselves fair credit, even while we acknowledge where we have to improve. We must also acknowledge what we have achieved. I think that was mentioned by Honorable Skelton earlier, and I thought I had said so. And to Mr. Smith's point, I did say earlier, and I read it, not to be misquoted, that the, that the residents don't trust governance of our people by your people. So we have to put those things, as um, I think someone else has said, we have to put them in the Constitution so that they could be held accountable or in, in whatever other laws. The enforcement, I agree with Mr. Smith, enforcement is an issue, and we know who is in charge of that. They have one more point. With Scotland, one of the main contention is that there 
was this thing called the Sewell Convention, which was an undertaking given in the settlement agreement between the UK and Scotland. The UK will not normally legislate on matters affecting Scotland without consulting Scotland. The UK went ahead with Brexit, regardless of the vast majority of Scotland citizens voting against the exit. So the Seville Convention was disregarded by the UK. And therefore, the Scottish people are realizing that you have no security and no reliance on agreements. The agreement stands for nothing. They are realizing that they were in an illusion. They have a legislature that can be bull bulldozed over at the whims and fancy of the UK. And that is the same thing we may well face with the brewing storms here in the Virgin Islands. So if we stay in the arrangement that we are in, then we risk being blown left and right at the convenience of the UK. And even if it is to our detriment. Thank you. All right. Are there any further questions? If not, it's a good time for us to close. Any, Ms. Smith, anything else on Facebook? Okay, thank you very much. I'll turn to Ms. Um, Louis to give the vote of thanks. Good evening to live audience and to those listening via social media. We have come to the end of a very informative presentation and discussion this evening as we shared and attempted to bring clarity to and engage the BVI community in matters relating to our Virgin Islands Constitution. As one of the aims, among others, in putting on this signature event was to raise public awareness of the constitutional development overall and of the Virgin Islands Constitution in 2007 to engage the people of the Virgin Islands in discussion so that together we can determine whether and what constitutional changes are desirable or needed. The general public, as we have seen, have spoken in this forum with many concerns, the main concerns being some of the questions that were asked, and without going into too much detail, I will just reiterate a couple of them. Who can run for elected office? There was the question of trust, of and accountability by all leaders. And there was concerns about the next steps that we should take in self-determination. And so there was definitions of this term, self-determination, the possible models for the next steps being pre-independence, such as what pertains in the Bermuda Constitution, though we have learned they have not actually taken that step to date. We have thus discussed integration and free association. It would be good, though, if we had um, examples, um, good examples of um, those aspects to discuss further. Uh, most important, though, we, um, we are constantly reminded of the, the need for education of the community on these issues so that we can move forward, you know, effectively. Uh, what also came out was a development that took place after our own elected leaders um, were you know, at the helm of driving social, economic, and political de development. At this point, though, on behalf of the members of the Constitutional Review Commission, it is now my task to thank a number of persons and entities for their unwavering support and assistance in making tonight's event uh, a success, the success that it was. The persons and entities that have contributed are the H. Laverty Stowe Community College for rental of this Eileen L. Parsons Auditorium and the technical advice and support that the HLSC team so ably provided. We want to say thanks also to the Government Information Service for their technical support as well and for live streaming on Facebook. They also prepared the flyers for the event, for that we thank you. To the various media houses for coverage of the event, including Caribbean Broadcasting Network for live air coverage, to the Beacon for being present here at the auditorium this evening. To you, the public, for your participation, both face-to-face -face and online, 
and also to the members of the Constitutional Review Commission who are present here at the auditorium this evening and Mrs. Ms. Georges Noni uh, via social media who have all engaged in the informative presentations and addressed the concerns of the community. We are encouraging all members of the community to continue to attend the various public consultations, whether it's a single individual or by group. Your written comments, again, we remind you are welcome and may be submitted to us at our website, www.yourconstitution.vg. So please visit our website also for any additional information that you may need and for scheduling to the various communities as we attempt to wrap up this segment of our assignment. I thank you all and wish everyone a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>